Uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Dr. Matthew Becker um, with us today. He received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from the Ohio State University and his PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Florida, Gainesville. Um, and while at UF, Matthew was the first PhD student to join the research group of Dr. Ed Phelps, where he investigated immunotherapies for treating type 1 diabetes autoimmunity. He was awarding both an NIH T32 interdisciplinary fellowship and an NIH F31 individual fellowship for his work. Kudos for that. That's awesome. And Matthew is now a postdoctoral uh, scholar with Dr. Jessica Weaver at ASU or Arizona State University, investigating the immunomodulatory properties of tropoblasts, as well as applications for a novel injection molded hydrogel technology. And we've had both um, Dr. Phelps and Dr. Weaver at the Sugar Science, and you can hear their um, talks um, in our library, if you wish. Um, and uh, today uh, he's going to talk about. Um, immune engineering extracellular vesicles as a potential cell-free therapy for type 1 diabetes, kind of following on the heels of a great paper they just had in science. Um, so we're very excited to hear more about these, um, this approach. And I'm going to drop the, um, the link to the paper in the chat for people to take a look at if they want. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And um, Take it away. We can't wait to hear awesome. um, what's going on in the lab down at ASU. Yeah, well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and yeah, as, as she's uh, mentioned, I was in Ed Phelps' lab at the University of Florida. Um, so even though I'm at ASU now um, with Dr. Weaver, this work that I'm talking about and going to kind of walk you through was a large part of what I did during my PhD um, with Ed Phelps. Um, and, you know, kind of the, a funny thing, you know, talking about these immune engineered EVs, you know, when I was decided I wanted to go to UF and deciding whose lab I wanted to be in, um, I kind of had a, a discussion with, with uh, Ed and was like, you know, I'd really like to be in your lab, but on the condition that I get to work on this one particular project. And he kind of looked at me and was like, go for it, it's yours. Um, and so, you know, five and a half years of working on this project, I didn't realize it was gonna be so difficult, but uh, ended up being very rewarding. And um, I'll take you through some of that, some of that story here today. Um, and so, you know, today is of course Halloween. So happy Halloween. Um, I just wanted to kind of share some of my favorite old costumes um, from all the universities that I've, I've been at. So, um, you know, whichever one is your, I think, I always think the Buckeyes costumes from, you know, the 40s and 50s are just weird. Um, and this yeah. is one of those old ones on the left there. That is very um, funny. That's uh, that's Ohio, the Ohio State University. Is that a chestnut? Um, so it's a Buckeye. A Buckeye is a, a tree nut. And the Buckeye <laughs> tree is the state tree of Ohio, which is why they're the Ohio State Buckeyes. I don't, nobody really knows that unless they go there. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's it's hard to know what that is, but it's great to, that's a good trivia fact. And I will have that. <laughs> In addition, yes. to, in addition to being informed about, uh, yeah. you know, these EVs in context of T1. Yeah. Um, and so then the middle there is obviously the Florida Gators. Um, at one point, they did have a live mascot. That is not a live alligator, um, but they did have a live mascot at one point. Um, so there's another trivia fact for you. And then on the right, finally, is Sparky the Sun Devil. And another trivia fact, Sparky is one of two or three college mascots in the U.S. to be designed by Walt Disney. Um, so there was some trivia all around for you there. But anyway, ready, ready for back the to the top. Pub back trivia. to the top of hand. Yeah. Um, That's great. So, Thanks for sharing those. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about type 1 diabetes um, in the sense that it's an autoimmune disease, um, right, and trying to develop immunotherapies for it. So we're kind of, or I think most of us here should be familiar with the concept of T1D as an autoimmune disease, where kind of after this um, series of antigen recognition events and some sort of inflammatory stimulus, we have T cells, both CD4 and CD8, that go into the islets of Langerhans and basically destroy the insulin producing beta cells, right? That leads to an inability to produce insulin and lots of negative downstream effects. And we can see kind of the hallmarks of this in some histology um, cross-sections. These are all provided by um, NPOD, the network for pancreatic organoids diabetes, which is partially run out of the University of Florida. So I was lucky to be at UF and have access to all these 
wonderful tools and um, investigators there. But you can see in this top image, uh, this brown is stating for CD3, which is T cells, and this kind of magenta color is glucagon, so that indicates there's an islet there with alpha cells, and we see this large mass of T cell infiltration. And then down below, we can see kind of this um, really stark dichotomy between um, you know, sections taken from an organ donor that did not have diabetes, and we see this really beautiful insulin and glucagon staining, indicating beta cells and alpha cells. But then if we take a, a section from an organ donor, their pancreas, that, and they did have diabetes, we see just this complete absence of insulin staining telling us all these beta cells are gone. So if we start to think about um, kind of, you know, how we can treat diabetes, right? We, we have the current standard of care, which is just insulin administration. Um, you know, we can think about maybe beta cell replacement therapies, but if we're talking about, you know, saving those beta cells, right, that's kind of one of these, these main research pushes, how can we save those beta cells that are there and do that with some sort of immune therapy? So we can start to break the disease down at different stages, right? And think about this in terms of, you know, beta cell mass where, you know, shortly after birth, out to two years, an individual will have developed their peak beta cell mass. Um, and then if they go on to develop type one diabetes, they'll have these stages of autoantibody positivity, um, where, you know, at one point they'll be euglycemic, so everything will seem okay with their beta cells. They'll go on to be dysglycemic, and they start to lose a lot more of that beta cell mass. Then finally, in stage three of the disease, they're going to start to acquire insulin therapy because they've lost most to all of their beta cell mass. And we can kind of correlate this to windows of opportunity for treating with immune therapies, right, where the further along you go in the disease progression, the kind of smaller that window of opportunity for an immune therapy and the less efficacious it's going to be. So if we're in stage three of disease, um, clinical disease diagnosis, there's not a lot of beta cell mass left. So, you know, doing some sort of immune therapy to save that beta cell mass isn't really going to have, you know, a whole lot of efficacy there. But if we can catch the disease kind of in one of these first two stages where there's autoantibody positivity, um, but there's still remaining beta cell mass, maybe there's a chance that an immune therapy can save whatever beta cell mass is there. And so that's kind of where Headspace was here for this project, is how can we intervene with the immune process, the antigen recognition process, and halt the disease before it's too late for those remaining beta cells. And we're, of course, not the first ones to think about this. Um, there are several immune therapies that have gone through clinical trials. Um, Teplizumab, which is an anti-CD3, was just recently approved. Um, so these are all small molecule biologics, but then there's also groups that have started to look at using uh, T cells, um, so regulatory T cells, as a therapy as well. And so this, this idea of using an immunotherapy to kind of train or retrain the immune system to not target beta cells, um, or really to just kind of turn off the immune system in a certain aspect, has been around for a while. Um, and there's been a few different approaches to doing this. Some of them have been uh, very efficacious, others need a little more work. Um, but I just kind of wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, we're not the first ones to think about this, but we are taking our own kind of our own crack at it here. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in some ways, you know, the some of the initial approaches have been sort of broad brush, right? And now... Yes. Um, people, scientists are starting to really drill down into, I don't even want to call it to personalized sort of medicine or personalized approaches. And it, it does kind of um, recall sort of the, the breast cancer progression where, you know, at first it was just sort of one and done and now yeah. it's quite um, specific. Yeah, exactly. Starting to get into these more kind of personalized medicine approaches. Um, and kind of going hand in hand with that and something that uh, I was particularly interested in. Um, and I think Ed's group in general is still interested in, um, and we're also interested in, in the Weaver Lab, is how can we have kind of this personalized approach, but also in an antigen specific manner. Um, and kind of one of the downsides um, with these treatments that I'm you know, showing here is, you know, they, they, some of them, like I said, can be very effective, but it's kind of broad scale immunosuppression in some sense, rather than just dealing with uh, the part of the immune system that's targeting the beta cells. And if we could have a therapy that's antigen specific and, you know, can catch the, the immune progression um, before it's too late for these remaining beta cells, 
that would be you know kind of this the, the ideal scenario um, we're yeah. not quite there yet obviously but we're taking steps to get there keep keep patients or from being patients keep them in remission yes exactly and so the the pathway that we kind of set our eyes on was this pd1 pdl pdl1 pathway um and as monica mentioned um there's been you know with with breast cancer therapies with other um cancer therapies in general, there's been a pretty big interest in this particular immune checkpoint pathway, PD-1, PD-L1. Um, and the reason for that is if, if a T cell is expressing this, this molecule here, PD-1, or program death one, uh, program death protein one, alongside its T cell receptor, and these two molecules come into contact with a tumor cell or really any other cell that's expressing uh, target MHC and program death ligand one or PDL1. This is going to lead to down regulation of T cell activity. And this is how a lot of cancers actually evade the immune system is through overexpression of this PDL1 molecule. And this eventually leads to just T cell exhaustion, right? And so that's that's a hallmark of a lot of cancers is this T cell exhaustion. They kind of have this PD1, um, this PD1 phenotype. And we've also kind of seen evidence for this in type 1 diabetes, where if we have a cytotoxic T cell, an islet autoreactive T cell that is attacking a beta cell, right? We have this TCR and peptide MHC match that happens when we get immune attack. But if, be if these beta cells are expressing PDL1 and that comes into contact with T cells expressing PD1, this can lead to uh, down regulation of autoreactive T cells. And so this idea that really has taken a strong hold in the kind of cancer immunotherapy um, field of study is starting to get some attention in the type 1 diabetes um, kind of disease progression area as well, or area of study as well. And there's been several research groups that have kind of looked at this and they've seen some interesting things. So, you know, first and foremost, PD-1 is expressed on islets. Uh, islet infiltrating T cells in NOD mice. So that's the non-obese diabetic um, uh, mouse strain that a lot of researchers use for you know, studies involving type 1 diabetes research. PDL1 is also expressed on beta cells at the periphery of islets in, in NOD mice. So there's some, some speculation that you know, it could be if these beta cells are kind of at the periphery of islets and they're expressing PDL1, that might be kind of a, a way that these beta cells are trying to evade immune attack and stop those T cells from infiltrating further into, into the islets. There's also PDL1 is expressed in islets of people with type 1 diabetes that has been found. And it's also upregulated by pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma. So again, you know, some sort of inflammatory stimulus um, happens in, in uh, the pancreas in islets of individuals with type 1 diabetes and this inflammatory stimulus can lead to upregulation of PDL1 on specifically beta cells. And then some interesting things as well is that anti PD1 or PDL1 cancer therapies, so these immune checkpoint therapies, can also lead to development of a, a sort of autoimmune diabetes in a, a subset of patients that receive them. So, whatever, um, so blocking this particular pathway in cancer patients can maybe sort of unlock a latent uh, beta cell autoimmunity. Um, and so this has been some really interesting evidence that has emerged um, in several case studies through, through the past uh, five to 10 years. And then lastly, you know, I mentioned on the last slide that um, there are several kind of immune therapies that are in clinical trials for type 1 diabetes. And several of them um, for things like teplizumab and alefacept uh, are correlated. So positive responses to these particular small molecule drugs are correlated with T-cell exhaustion markers or T-cell exhaustion phenotypes that include PD-1. So there's kind of this preponderance of evidence that is beginning to point towards the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway playing an important role in beta cell autoimmunity. And maybe something is going wrong with this particular pathway that's causing kind of that's maybe causing it to shut down and allowing T cells to infiltrate into these islets that would otherwise be you know, relatively okay. And so, you know, as I mentioned, we're we're trying to take this pathway and see if we can exploit it um, kind of in the opposite or in the same way that cancer cells do, right? So cancer cells are overexpressing PDL1 and that's how they evade the immune system. Maybe we can use something with PDL1 to train the immune system to avoid beta cells. Um, 
And so another one of the interesting things about this pathway is that its particular signaling mechanism allows for cell and tissue specific tolerance. So if we kind of break this down and think about initial T cell priming, right? We have a T cell that's interacting with an adjutant presenting cell or an APC. And there are these two main uh, signaling mechanisms that are happening where we have the T cell receptor interacting with peptide HLA. And that's signal one. Signal two is CD28 interacting with CD80 or CDD6. And this is kind of this co-stimulatory um, signal that allows for initial T cell priming, T cell activation. Right, so if this is happening, we're getting stimulation and activation. Conversely, if an antigen presenting cell has PDL1, this is going to recruit PD1 to, to this kind of uh, signaling um, complex and recruit some SHIP2 phosphatases. And really downstream, what ends up happening is that you get down regulation of the signaling cascades for this TCR and CD28. But this particular interaction, PD1 and PDL1, it's been found that it really only happens when the T cell receptor is interacting with peptide MHC. So if you don't have that interaction happening, there's a very, very low chance that you're going to have PD1 interacting with PDL1. So this can kind of start to allow, and you can start to, start to think about, well, maybe this is actually an antigen specific interaction that's happening. And so if we think about this in the context of type 1 diabetes, once initial T cell activation has occurred, if an activated T cell comes into contact with a non-beta cell, right, this T cell receptor is not going to recognize that peptide HLA. And even if this non-beta cell has pdl one that interaction can't take place with PD-1 because there's no interaction taking place between the TCR and peptide HLA. But if we have a beta cell, and this T cell is specific for the beta cell, we have that interaction taking place between the TCR and peptide HLA. And if that beta cell happens to have PDL1 and the T cell has PD1, then that can lead to down regulation of that TCR uh, signaling cascade and eventually um, just down regulation of that T cell. So it's not going to attack and kill that beta cell. So there's this, this idea that we kind of have, right? Where we we're taking all these lessons learned in cancer immunotherapy, we're trying to exploit the fact that this pathway may be important in type 1 diabetes and the fact that it's antigen specific. And then you may be asking yourself, well, you know, this is about exercise vesicles, right? Well, yes. And that's kind of where I'll, where I'll guide you through next in, in terms of um, this idea that we had. And really, it boils down to what extracellular vesicles are and what roles they perform in natural biological processes. So the long and short of it is that EVs, whether they're apoptotic bodies, micro <laughs> whatever they are, they're basically cellular messengers. They convey messages between cells um, out of the short distances or long distances. And those messages can be in the form of nucleic acids like DNA or RNA. They can be in the form of metabolites. They can be in the form of proteins. And one of the cool things about EVs is that a lot of the times they can convey immune responses. And so this has been seen again in a cancer setting, right? So we're taking a lot of these lessons learned in a cancer setting. Um, and we've, we've seen in the literature that EVs can contain pdl one So EVs can get released from tumor cells and they contain pdl one And this can downregulate T-cell responses in that cancer setting, which is pretty interesting. But then there's also been a couple of studies looking at specifically at cancer cell EVs and removing pdl one not from the cancer cells, but from the EVs themselves. And they've seen that if we remove PDL1 just from the EVs, this can restore tumor uh, T cell responses against tumors. So again, we're seeing, you know, this really interesting phenomena happening with PDL1, but this time it's in particularly EVs. And this is all in a cancer setting, but what about in kind of the, the type 1 diabetes setting? Well, there's also been evidence that EVs can contain uh, antigens if they are released from beta cells. Right, so if we have a beta cell and it's releasing exosomes or microvesicles, whatever species of EV that can contain beta cell autoantigens. And it's also been found that these EVs can then go on to activate antigen presenting cells and T cells. So now kind of all the pieces were there 
how do we put them together? Well, we know that this PD-1, pd one pathway is important in type 1 diabetes. We know that we can take PDL1 and EVs from cancer cells, and this has an effect on the immune system. We know that EVs from beta cells contain autoantigens, and that can have an effect on the immune system. And then the question kind of arose, can we take EVs, load them with beta cell autoantigens, and then next to that kind of autoantigen presentation include this PDL1 molecule? Right? So again, this is antigen specific beta cell autoantigens and put all these things together. Will that work as kind of a therapeutic? And really one of the cool things about EVs is that whether they come from, um, whether they're you know, apoptotic bodies or whether they're microvesicles or whether they're exosomes, again, whatever species you, you wanna, you know, is your, is your pick of the day, any protein that's expressed on the surface of the cell that's releasing EVs, that same protein can also be expressed on the surface of the EV. And that's simply due to the natural biogenesis pathway of these extracellular vesicles. So then if we have cells that have these proteins of interest, the idea is we can take EVs that also have these proteins of interest. And so that's kind of where, where our headspace is going into this. So it feels like you're... Um you're trying to create a larger signal with your, you know, your kind of uh, manufactured um, EVs, right? Then, then, then what might be coming off of this beta cell itself, or, or is that not right? Um, that that's a part of it, yeah. So, you know, kind of um, creating a larger signal can is going to be beneficial, right? Creating more of this kind of negative uh, immune stimulus mm -hmm. to, you know train the immune system, if you, if you have more of that, then there's a better chance that you can interact with the subset of the immune system that you're trying to interact with. The other positive thing about it is, um, and I, I think I may touch on this a little bit later, is that this has the potential to be a cell-free therapy. Right. So you can engineer cells out the wazoo and do, do whatever you want to them and put them into a patient but the prospect of getting that through, you know, regulatory approval can be a little daunting for cell therapies. Yeah, but if always we can, the bar, always the bar to keep in mind. Exactly right. So you know, if we can take cells and engineer them, but then just take cell products, and these cell products have basically the same um, signaling uh, proteins on them that the cells have, but they're not living cells; they're not dividing cells. Yeah. that likely has a lower bar to get through regulatory approval. So that's kind of, you know, we can provide a, a larger overall signal, but we can also maybe have a little bit easier time in terms of regulatory aspects. For yeah, this getting it to the clinic. Therapy. Definitely getting it to the clinic. We have a question from Reza Yarani. How to make sure that the PDL one are expressed on the surface of the EVs and they are not luminal? In another word, uh, are we sure the PDL one is on the EV surface? If it's not, what happens to the signaling mechanism you just described? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And it's something um, that we thought about a lot uh, when we're trying to kind of work through this, um, developing this kind of strategy. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned kind of in my last point here, if, if, the, if there's a protein that's expressed on the surface of a cell, they're just through the, the natural biogenesis mechanisms for how these EVs are made, a portion of that protein is going to end up on the surface of the extracellular vesicles. Um, because either through this kind of budding off of the plasma membrane or through this series of uh, double invagination, this protein will end up uh, on the surface. But, you know, we, we have to check and make sure that that's actually happening. And so one of the things that we had to do was um, basically measure the biological activity of the, the signals on these EVs through, through several um, immunological assays. So doing things like ELISAs, right? W without lysing the EVs, can we measure bioactive pd one on the surface of the EVs? Um, that's something that we had to look at. And I'll go through some of that data later. Um, but then kind of the last point that Reza brought up was, well, what happens if this uh, signal, if this PDL one is luminal and it's not on the surface of, um, of the EV? In that case, you know, it probably wouldn't be as effective, right? Because at that point, that signals, that signaling molecule, the PDL one is going to have to go through 
a lot more steps to get to the right confirmation to give that signal to the target cells. So it is possible that you know a luminal uh, PDL1 signal can get to the target cells, um, but that EV would have to be taken up by probably an antigen presenting cell, would have to be processed in a certain manner, and then that protein content uh, of the EV would have to be recycled onto the APC, the antigen presenting cell um, membrane to then be able to be presented to um, to the, the cell of interest. And that's- yeah. That's good, that's a long shot. Yeah, exactly. Um, and actually one of the things that, that we found and that I'll go into, into some detail later does involve uh, uptake of these EVs by antigen presenting cells, but there's a different pathway that we believe is being um, followed by the the protein content by the by the EVs into these APCs, and I'll get I'll get to that in a little bit. But safe to say, if the if the signaling proteins are luminal, it's a much longer shot to get that signal to where we need it to be. Quick question here from an MD: Is there a regulatory precedent for EVs? There have been several clinical trials with. Oh. I don't know that any of them are clinically approved, um, but there has been, you know, especially in the past uh, decade, past 10 years or so, there have been several uh, clinical trials looking at EVs, both as biomarkers for various diseases and as um, potential therapeutics for, for diseases. Um, so as, as far as getting some of these approved, like completely approved, no precedent there, but there is some some precedent for how to start to get them through phase one and two clinical trials. I'll drop a nice review by Emily Sims um, into the chat. People can take yeah. a look at it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have kind of all this background information, all these pieces are all kind of nebulous, and how do we start to distill them down into kind of a, kind of a central question, a central kind of theme here? And so... Uh, the overall kind of hypothesis and kind of story that I'll guide you through is that we can engineer extracellular vesicles and get them to deliver peptide HLA complexes alongside either co-stimulation or co-inhibition in the form of PDL1 to modulate T cell effector functions. Right? So we can take our engineered EVs and they have peptide HLA, they have PDL1. And if we introduce these to kind of a, a target effector cell system. The idea is that these EVs would be able to provide this PDL1 signal and induce this T cell suppression. And particularly here, we're looking at CD8 T cell or cytotoxic T cell uh, suppression. And so, you know, we have this central hypothesis, this central guiding kind of theme. But going through these these next several slides, I kind of want to give you a little bit of, you know, what's the what are the steps we went through? What's kind of the the methodology that we're going through here? To get from you know this idea to kind of a, kind of an end product, and so the first and foremost, we have to have some way to isolate these EVs. Um, a lot, or kind of the gold standard for EV isolation in the past has been this serial ultra centrifugation, um, and that is something that um, that that we started with in in the Phelps lab, right? Where you take kind of this cell conditioned um, medium and you subject it to a series of centrifugations starting at kind of lower speeds and then getting up to you know hundreds of thousands of uh, Gs. And then eventually you're left with kind of this cell, or not the cell, um, this EV pellet. And you know maybe you have enough to do your experiments, maybe you don't. It can be contaminated with other proteins or lipids and things like that. So we really kind of wanted to get away from that and figure out uh, an alternative method to purify larger um, larger batches of EVs and also have, you know, more pure batches of EVs as opposed to kind of this other method that um, the field started out with. So we need some way to isolate EVs. Okay, well, once we are able to isolate EVs, we need some sort of um, in vitro system in which to test them in. So how do we develop a system with relevance to T1D that we can, you know, use our EVs in and see are they effective? Are they not effective? What kind of what do they do to, to the model system that we're working with? Quick question from the audience. Are these EVs HLA restricted? Uh, that is a great question. And yes, they are. Um, so that's, that's one of the other things that we wanted to take in, into consideration. And, um, you know, some of the, the tools that we were working with, 
um, in, in the Phelps lab and in collaboration with Todd Brusco, who's also at UF. Um, he's there involved with the, the Diabetes Institute. Um, the, so the tools we're working with were HLA restricted. Um, and so, you know, that's, that comes into play, especially if we start to talk about this antigen specificity. If we want to have antigen specificity, we need to have, you know, target cells that have, you know, a specific HLA, a specific peptide HLA complexes. We also need to have effector cells, so the T cells that recognize that particular peptide MHC or that particular HLA. Um, and so, yes, these, these EVs, the, the target cells, the effector cells, this whole system that we ended up working with was antigen specific. And I'll get into some of that, uh, some of that data a little bit later, um, just to kind of, you know, say, look, we're working with the system. It is, in fact, um, what we say it is. So second step, come up with some sort of system to test our EVs once we've isolated them. And then lastly, uh, we take these EVs, we take this uh, cell system, we put them all together. What happens if we add EVs to our system? Do we, do we see the effects that we hypothesize are going to be there? And so these are kind of the three main um, steps that we're going through, the three main stories that we're going through in order to get from, again, this kind of nebulous concept, this, this hypothesis, just to, to kind of an answer, is this a feasible um, therapy or not? And so starting out, um, we need to have you know, some sort of cell line, something to get our EVs from. Before we can think about how do we uh, isolate EVs, we need to think about, well, what's the source for these? And so as I mentioned, we're working, we were working with uh, Todd Brusco's lab, and they have um, several of these uh, K562 cell lines, um, and they're, they're engineered to, to express um, certain, certain proteins. And so the one that we ended up working with was um, modified to express HLA-A2. So this is a very common uh, class 1 HLA allele found in the general population, which means it's also very common in type 1 diabetes patients. They were also modified to express CD80. So that's the signal 2 um, that T cells need for activation. And then these K562s are also engineered to express pre-pro-insulin. So if we're talking about beta cell autoimmunity, many, um, many of the autoantigens are derived from insulin. And so in this particular cell line that we have, where we have the full-length pre-pro-insulin protein, um, and so that can give us um, kind of this antigen specificity um, in, in these cells, as well as hopefully in their EVs. And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. But the long and short of it is, you know, we have kind of these base K562 cells, right? They've been modified to express HLA-A2 and CD80. And, you know, through flow cytometry, we can see that they're, both of these markers are very highly expressed. And so this was kind of the starting point for us of, okay, we have, we have a cell line. Um, we know that it expresses HLA-A2. We know that it has pre insulin. So any of these pre insulin peptides that the cell is starting to break down and maybe load into HLA, um, that can be good for us as well because that means that they're just going to be loaded into our EVs. And then I'll get into this a little bit later as well, but it also ended up, we think, being pretty important to have CD80 there, so this co-stimulatory molecule. And so we see that both of those are there. Great. You know, how do we move on from there? So... I mentioned before that, you know, kind of the gold standard for EV isolation has been serial ultrasensitivation. We tried that, didn't really like it a whole lot. So we kind of searched around, dug through the literature and found um, that there are a couple of groups who have started to use uh, <laughs> exclusion chromatography, um, particularly bind elute size exclusion chromatography. So this is basically separating out the EVs from all the contaminating proteins through size exclusion chromatography. We did end up you know, finding out that there is some kind of pre-processing and post-processing involved with that, right? So we have our self-conditioned media. We, we take it through a couple of kind of pre-processing, um, low speed centrifugations, and then we filter it, right? So this is to get rid of um, not only to reduce the volume of this overall sample, because we can only load so much volume into our chromatography column, but also to help us get rid of some of these contaminating proteins. Once we have kind of this um, filtered uh, cell condition medium, we have a chromatography system in the lab, and we use a particular um, 
a particular chromatography column that I mentioned, it's bind elute size exclusion. And so you can see this is monitored with just a simple UV chromatogram. We have the, these EVs that separate out very early in the elution process. And then all the contaminating proteins are basically sequestered by the column. Um, and so they're, they stay in there, EVs can go right through, and we can collect those with an automated fraction collector. And then later, when we clean the column, we can see all the contaminated proteins leave the column. So there's this really nice separation between what, what we see as EVs and what we see as contaminating proteins. That's nice. What's your yield on that for the EVs? So it depends on the, the starting volume that we use. Um, but typically, you know, I would load anywhere between maybe 20 to 30 milliliters. So let me step back a little bit. We would start with about 300 milliliters of self-conditioned media, um, get that down to about 20 to 30 milliliters through this kind of pre-processing and uh, filtration steps. And then that 20 to 30 milliliters would go through our uh, size exclusion chromatography. And at the end of it, we, we would end up with, you know, maybe 500 microliters to one milliliter of, of, um, of product. And that would contain anywhere between like 25 to 50 um, micrograms of, of protein. Um, and so in terms of yield, you know, maybe, you know, if, if you're familiar with the EV space, you could think, well, you know, that's not a whole lot of, of protein. But the thing with this particular method is that all that protein that we're getting is EV protein and none of it is contaminating protein. So if, if we go back to um, the, the serial ultrasensitivation, which is kind of that gold standard method, you can get higher yields, but they're less pure. Um, mm -hmm. And so we believe that, th that this particular methodology that we're using is a little bit superior because we can get you know, yields that are in the same order of magnitude but they're more pure. And really, this, this is only limited by, you know, how big is your column and how much can you, can you get through that column at one time before you have to just like clean it and start over. Um, so nice. we, we, we ended up being pretty happy with this particular methodology. Um, and so at the end of that, we take our, we take our EVs um, and we subject them to one more kind of filtration step where we go from maybe 10 mils that comes out of this chromatography uh, setup, and then we get down to 500 microliters to one mil, and we take our final EV product. And it's then with this EV product that we can do kind of uh, quality control, make sure that we're getting actual EVs. Um, and then we can also take this and start to do some of our downstream, um, downstream experiments. But just to kind of, you know, go through the, the fact that, you know, we have EVs, um, one of the really nice things about this particular method is that it's highly repeatable. And so this is looking at um, maybe eight or nine different chromat uh, UV chromatograms. Um, so this is eight or nine different separate EV isolation um, runs. And you can see through all of them, we have this really clear, distinct area where the EVs are eluding out and where the contaminating proteins are eluding out. And the only difference, you know, why these peaks aren't lining up perfectly is because of the starting volume that we're working with. Whether that's, you know, 20 to 30 mils, you're gonna to to see a slight difference in where these peaks end up being. But it is highly repeatable what we're seeing here. Um, we can take kind of this final EV product and do, like I said, kind of some quality control, make sure that we're actually getting EVs. So this is looking at a natural nanoparticle tracking analysis. And this is a, a histogram of kind of the, the uh, particle sizes that are in our final EV product. Um, EVs, uh, especially smaller EVs like exosomes, um, have a range between 30 and 150 nanometers. And that is you know, pretty much exactly what we're seeing here with a nice peak at about 75 nanometers. And we're getting um, pretty good yield. You know, so about 90 billion particles per mil. Um, we can also look for certain protein markers. So again, because of the biogenesis pathway of EVs, they're all gonna have distinct markers that are telling you they're derived from these pathways and they are in fact these EVs. So two of them are gonna be Alex and Centenin-1. And there's plenty, there's you know literature going back years and years um, for both Alex and Centenin-1 as being EV markers. And then something that we are also really interested in, um, again, if we're trying to get into this antigen specificity, is we want to make sure that there's HLA. 
right? And so this is also in fact in our EVs. And then finally, just looking at TEM, um, EVs have a, a circular kind of cup shaped morphology. I like to think of it as like a, like a deflated basketball. And so you can see this shape here appearing um, in several places. And you know, this, this is all telling us that this process that we're using, it's scalable, it's repeatable, and it gives us the EVs that we, that we think it's giving us. And so this is kind of the first step for us that I mentioned, right? We need to have some way to get our EVs. So then where do we go from there? We have to find some way, some cell system to test these in. And so we're getting our EVs from these uh, K562 cells, as I mentioned. Well, we want to have some sort of kind of effector cell or model T cell um, to interact with these, with these antigen specific, to interact with this cell and these EVs in an antigen specific manner. And so again, from the Brusco lab, um, we were able to get these engineered T cells. So these are engineered cognate T cells. They're on the, um, they're Jercat T cells, and they've been modified to express CD8 and this particular T cell receptor, which is the 1E6 T cell receptor. Um, and there's been some really great work from Mark Peekman's group showing that this T cell receptor binds to a preproinsulin peptide, so PPI 15 to 24, in HLA-A2. And so... If you'll remember, we have our, um, our antigen presenting cells, these K562s. They have the full preproinsulin peptide, uh, the full preproinsulin protein. They have HLA-A2. So if we put these two cells together, we should see some sort of antigen recognition. And so just to test that, you know, we, we did some, some cold cultures, looked at some flow cytometry, just some uh, activation markers. After 24 hours, we did see increased CD69, which is an early activation marker for T cells in these DIRCATs. And then we also, importantly, saw PD1. So if PD1 is not there, then that kind of, you know, there was a wrench in the whole plan of looking at the PD1, PD, L1 interaction. But upon recognition of the eight peptide HLA, we do see some upregulation of PD1 in these T cells. So that's good for us as well. And so then the other thing we wanted to see was, are these T cells actually antigen specific or is this just kind of like some non-specific interactions that were taking place? And so this is, you know, looking at how do we conceptualize this? How do we set this up? So if we have our T cells, right, they have CD8 in this T cell receptor, and we put them in cold cultures with either these non-engineered antigen presenting cells or engineered antigen presenting cells in this in the latter case, we should see IL-2 secretion. IL-2 is um, um, a cytokine that's secreted by activated T cells. And so um, one of the great things as well about JERCATs is that um, you can use IL-2 as a reporter of activation because they secrete plenty of it when they become activated. So we should see some IL-2 um, release. The next thing we wanted to do was, okay, well, what if we overload the system with kind of this relevant uh, peptide, if we overload with exogenous PPI-1524. So this is the peptide that the T cell should be recognizing. You know, if we have non-engineered cells, they don't have uh, any HLA, nothing should happen. But in the case where the APCs do have HLA, all these endogenous peptides that aren't necessarily the cognate peptide, just by mass action, if you overload the system by mass action, those peptides will start to be replaced by kind of the, the peptide of interest. This will create more opportunities for antigen recognition by the T cell and will lead to increased IL-2 secretion. And then lastly, if we take kind of an irrelevant peptide, um, one that the T cells don't recognize, we overload the system, we should see less of this IL-2 secretion indicating less, excuse me, less um, antigen recognition. And this is actually what we saw in practice, right? So here we're just looking at simple IL-2 release from these T cells, where if you look at these kind of last two um, on the right, we'll see this is the group with the T cells and the non-engineered APCs, no IL-2 secretion. T cells with our engineered APCs, right? They start to have some IL-2 release indicating they're recognizing that cognate peptide. And then if we add in all this excess peptide, we can see the T cells are responding uh, in greater numbers, secreting more IL-2. So this is telling us, great, our T cells are recognizing all this peptide antigen that's being presented to them. And then that last case that I mentioned, if we take kind of an irrelevant peptide um, and we overload the system with that, this is this last group here. So going through, we have our T cells with engineered APCs, 
cells with APCs and the correct peptide overloaded, and then T cells engineered APCs, the incorrect peptide, we see that we actually see less IL2 secretion as opposed to if there's no peptide added into the system at all. So this is telling us kind of overall that these T cells are responding specifically to this peptide antigen being presented in HLA-A2. So that was great for us. Um, this is kind of a, a side story, and I just really want to briefly touch on it um, because I, th I think it's an important part of, of what was happening here. Um, and it, it involves CD80 or co-stimulation. And so one of the things that we, we kind of thought of along the way was, you know, if we're taking these, these cells and we're getting EVs from them, right, these engineered antigen presenting cells, and we're getting EVs from them, do we necessarily have to, you know, engineer these cells uh, kind of out the wazoo and get them to express all these relevant things? Or can we just take a cell line that already expresses the correct HLA um, and use these? And so um, we decided, okay, let's try using maybe these THP1 monocytes or macrophages because they do express HLA A2, right? So we can still, if we can load in our, our cognate uh, peptide like we were in the previous setup, maybe we can use these instead, right? They're, they're cheaper, they're more readily available. Um, and so, you know, we were just doing some flow cytometry to make sure that some of these markers are there. HLA-A2 is very highly expressed, but CD80 is not. Um, and so this is going to be important coming later on. But if you can see here, um, right where we have our engineered APCs, we have our T cells, all this nice setup that you've seen before, they secrete plenty of IL-2. But if we have our THP1 cells as the antigen presenting cells, it doesn't matter how much of this excess peptide we put in there. Because there's no co-stimulation, we're not seeing any sort of T cell activation, right? And so this, these are these last two groups that you're seeing here where we have without peptide and with peptide with our THP1s. We're not seeing any IL-2 secretion indicating that there's no T cell stimulation happening, T cell activation. And so I just kind of want you to remember this kind of point as we go forward and start to investigate some of our EV um, effects in this cell system. Okay, so we have our cell system with our engineered APCs. We have our cognate T cells. We have a methodology to get EVs from our engineered APCs. What happens when we start to put all these things together? And so the, the idea was we want these EVs, kind of these bare EVs, no PDL1. Theoretically, they're providing, they should be providing more peptide HLA for these T cells to recognize, right? And so that actually is what's happening. If we add in our EVs from these engineered APCs, we see a kind of a dose wise response. If we add in more EVs, we get higher amounts of IL2 secretion, which is indicating that you know, there's more uh, peptide HLA for the T cells to respond to. Interestingly though, one of the things that we tried was, okay, well, what if we just throw these EVs into monocultures with our T cells? And what happens if, you know, we throw in a bunch of ex all this excess peptide? What, something interesting that happened was that these T cells weren't responding to EVs alone. Even if we threw in all this excess peptide, you know, we're kind of overloading the system, didn't really matter, it's the T cells still weren't responding. And so this kind of led us to, to scratch our heads a little bit and think, okay, well, what's happening here? What's so special about maybe is it the APCs that's causing activation in one case, but if we take the APCs out, you know, why don't we see anything? And so we kind of wanted to investigate this point a little further. And so what we did was some microscopy studies where we labeled our T cells in with one dye, we labeled our APCs with another dye, and we labeled our EVs with a third dye, and looked at some cold cultures and monocultures over the course of, I believe this was like 16 hours, 16 to 18 hours. And so, you know, what we saw is if we have our T cells and EV group, we don't see any of this EV signal. And that's likely because the resolution, the, the, mic the microscopy resolution, can't detect individual EV particles, they're too small. Um, but then interestingly, if we look at the group where we have our APCs and the EVs, we see all this nice EV signal. And it's all coming, most of it is coming from inside of the cells. Some of it is on the cell surface, but a lot of it is inside. Um, and so this was 
no really interesting to us because it starts to indicate that the antigen presenting cells are actually taking up the EVs and there's something that's happening there. Because again, if we put these, if we have this cold culture, right, we have our T cells in blue, we have our APCs in green, we have our EVs in red, we can see some EV signal, but pretty much all of it is coming from within the, the antigen presenting cells or these engineered uh, APCs that we're working with. And, you know, we can kind of quantify this, right, where we see we only have significant EV signal in the groups that have, um, in the group that has the, the, the engineered APCs, right, where we have our APCs, we have all this peptide in there, we have our EVs, we see some significant signal there. And so what this kind of led us to believe, and, you know, the evidence is kind of supporting this, is that antigen presenting cells in this particular case are actually required for our EVs to modulate T cell activity. And this is likely happening through endocytosis, right? We see this intracellular signal and cross-dressing of EV proteins onto APC surfaces. And so what I mean by cross-dressing is when an APC endocytosis, um, endocytosis and EV, all those proteins that are on the EV surface don't go through any sort of modifications they just get directly trafficked to the APC cell membrane. And there is precedent for this in the literature, um, especially when we're talking about um, uh, APCs, uh, endocytosing extracellular vesicles. You know, any cell can endocytose, particularly APCs, when they do this, they can go through this cross-pressing mechanism to get EV proteins directly onto the surface of the APC. And so this is kind of what we were thinking was happening in our system. Quick question, um, what is the EV labeling dye? Looks like, uh, is it DIR? Yes, it is, it's, it's DIR. Um, okay. And then both of the, the cell, the T cells were DII and the APCs were DIO. So they're all these lipophilic dyes um, yeah. that we're labeling the membranes with. And can you load multiple antigens in the EV? Um, theoretically, yes. That's not something that we tried to do. Um, there have been a couple of studies looking at kind of loading um, loading antigens into EVs through like chemical modifications. So kind of unfolding the the surface HLA um, pocket and releasing all of those um, peptides through kind of a mild acidification, introducing whatever uh, peptides of interest, and then allowing that pocket to kind of reform around them. Um, but, you know, in our case, we are just, again, using kind of this mass action, overloading the system. So we could have added multiple uh, peptides to the system and seen uh, multiple peptides loaded into these EVs as well, but that's not something that we looked at. Okay, got it. Okay. So all this has been kind of leading up to uh, kind of this final point of we have all these things, we have all these kind of pieces, but really we're interested in kind of this pdl one story, right? And so we wanted to make sure that we had a cell system that incorporated pdl one um, And so again, we took our K562 cells, which are these kind of engineered antigen presenting cells. We engineered them a little bit further to be able to stably express pdl one And then if we put them in kind of the same cold culture setup, right, where we can look at our engineered APCs with um, our T cells. And then if we put PDL1 into that mix, we would expect to see this PDL1, PD1 interaction taking place and causing kind of this uh, down regulation of T cell activity or a less secretion of IL2. And that's in fact what we were able to see, right? So these last two groups here where we have our engineered APCs. And then if we add PDL1 into the mix, we see a decrease in T cell activity. And so this is telling us at least that in our cells, our PDL1 is biologically active. So if we have PDL1 in our EVs, we would also expect to see it be biologically active. Um, and this, this same trend holds true even if we add in all this excess peptide like I've been talking about. So we overload the system with all this peptide. Our PDL1 in the, in the engineered cells is still able to suppress this T cell activation. So this is kind of good news for us going forward. So now we want to have EVs that have PDL1, right? So we were able to go through that process that I walked you through earlier, um, and then through some some ELISAs. Um, and again, this is without lysing the EVs. 
we're able to detect um, PDL1 in those EVs. So this is you know starting to tell us that 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 PDL1 can be biologically active. And then the question is, well, what happens if we throw these EVs into a, a cold culture system and they're the only source of PDL1, right? So we have our T cells, we have our engineered APCs. These don't have any PDL1 in them. What if our source of PDL1 is from our EVs? So similar to how we saw kind of a dose response with our non pdl one EVs, we also saw a dose response, but in the opposite direction. So the more EVs we added, the more decrease we saw in IL-2 secretion from our T cells, telling us that we're getting a decrease in T cell activation. And so this is really promising to us because, you know, in this model system where kind of everything, everything is really controlled, right? But in this controlled environment, we do see evidence that our engineered EVs can provide this source of PDL1 to the T cells and start to downregulate their activity. Now, I mentioned earlier that CD80 was going to be important. Um, and so we also you know, wanted to look at these THP1 cells and see if we could get them to express PDL1, and maybe we could use these EVs um, as, as an alternative. Um, and so you can see here, we just created these THP1 cells with the interferon gamma, they upregulate PDL1. And again, we can take this process for EV isolation and get EVs that have uh, all this PDL1. So you know, we have our, our EVs from our engineered cells, but then can we take EVs from just a, a regular cell line that we induce to express PD-01? The EVs have PD-01. Will these work instead, right? Interestingly, um, no, right? So if we take kind of going back to this first um, test that we were doing, where we, we look at a dose response where we add increasing amounts of our EVs to our cold culture system, and see, can they activate, right? In the absence of PDL1, can they provide more of this um, cognate antigen peptide HLA to the system? In the case of these EVs from the THP1 cells, right, this run of the mill cell line, they have HLA-A2. We're giving them plenty of excess peptide in the system. We don't see an increase in T cell activation, which we thought was a little odd. And then, kind of similarly, right, we we don't see the extent of downregulation from these EVs when they have pd one So this is the last group here, right, where we have um, kind of our, our control group where, you know, everything is, we have our T cells, our engineered APCs, all this excess peptide, lots of activation, out of secretion. If we add in these EVs from THP1 cells, the, the magnitude of that effect isn't the same as it was when we had our engineered EVs, our, our EVs from our engineered APCs. And if we look at this kind of across all the experiments that we did, only EVs from our engineered K562 cells were able to induce significant offense, effects on T cell activation, whether that was um, through increasing in the absence of PDL1 or decreasing in the presence of PDL1. And you know, there's there's multiple explanations for why this may be, but one of the things that we we kind of, you know picked up on when we're looking through the literature is that CD80 might actually be important for these effects if we're talking about stimulation or inhibition. So there, there's some really interesting work that's come out recently looking at um, PDL1 CD80 interactions on the same cell surface and how that can kind of interact with PDL1 and PD1 on the opposite cell surface. And because these THP1 cells that we're working with didn't have any CD80, we think that that may be contributing to why we're not seeing these effects that we do when the cell source has CD80. Um, you know, there could be other explanations, right? We're working with monocytes versus um, uh, a type of um, um, a, myelogen uh, a myeloid cell line versus just like monocyte macrophage. Um, so, you know, the, the base cell lines perform different immunological functions, but, you know, there is evidence to support the theory and kind of the idea that CD80, you know, it's obviously important in the stimulatory sense, but it could also be highly important in kind of the, the, the regulatory sense when we're talking about these PDL1, PD1 interactions. And so this is, you know, something that was really interesting to us and could be a very useful consideration going forward as, as kind of this therapy or the, these types of therapies develop with EVs. Um, 
And then kind of the last thing that I want to touch on here um, before, before I start to wrap up is, um, you know, we had really this nice kind of model cell system where we have our, our engineered APCs, we have our, our engineered T cells that are from a T, like all this is from cell lines. Um, but the T cells that we're working with were, were not true effector cells. And so what we wanted to do was try out our, our EV therapy in kind of a, a setting where we're working with true effector cells. And so again, we're working with the Brusco lab um, for this particular part, and they have this, um, they've developed this technology that they call T-cell avatars, um, where they can take T-cells from a healthy human individual, and they can essentially engineer them to have one specific T-cell receptor. And so in this case, we're taking primary human CDA T-cells, they're transduced with a TCR that recognizes um, another uh, peptide HLA that's relevant to type 1 diabetes. In this case, it's IGRP, um, again, presented in HLA-A2. And so what we're doing is basically loading our antigen-presenting cells with, again, all this exogenous uh, peptide, and these are kind of acting as our target cells. And so what we would expect to see is if we have our, our um, primary T cells, they're activated, they're ready to go, um, kill their target cells, we're having these as our target cells, we'd expect to see cell death. And so what we're doing is basically monitoring the cell death um, with flow cytometry after a 16 hour co-culture experiment. On the flip side of that, if we have this whole setup, but we add in our PDL on EVs, right, we'd expect to see as a source of PDL1, a decrease in the amount of cell lysis or cell death. And again, this is what we're seeing, right? This is what we're seeing in, in, the, in the case where we have true effector cells, right? And this is this, this left group here. We have our true effector cells and our kind of target cells. You know, this is kind of our, our standard, right? Where we see, you know, 100% specific lysis normalized. Um, if we have engineered cells that have PDL1, right, then we see kind of a, a slight decrease in this cell specific lysis. But in the case where we have cells without any PDL1 and we and we add in these EVs as a source of PDL1. We see about a 60% reduction in the amount of cell specific lysis that's, that's taking place here. And so this is what really starts to give us some indication going forward that this type of cell free therapy can be effective at interfacing with effector T cells and kind of reprogramming them or, or influencing how they're interacting with their target cells that they would otherwise normally um, basically, basically kill, right? So we can start to influence that interaction. Um, and I think that is the last piece of data I have, and it's been about an hour, so it's about time I wrap up anyway, um, but oh, kind of... Quick question. EVs contain many different components, which is dictated by the parental cells. Your EVs come from immortalized tumeric cells. Do you think it's proper for T1D treatment? As one can guess, it only it only doesn't have PDL one and HLA-A2. It has almost 3,000 more proteins and more nucleic acids. Will this be safe? Yeah, that, that's a, a very good point um, and actually something that we thought about as well. So one of the, the things that, um, you know, we started to think about maybe for some future directions was, as you mentioned, these EVs that we're generating are from an immortalized tumor cell line, right? The, the tumor cell line has been engineered to express a certain proteins of interest, but there's a bunch of other things there. Um, but something that we can start to think about is taking EVs from beta cells. Right, so now we can get in. We're getting into the era where we have stem cell derived beta cells, and we can engineer the stem cell derived beta cells to express certain proteins. Um, so you know they can express HLA. We can get them to express PDL1, and we know that beta cells from I'm sorry EVs from beta cells automatic they contain those autoantigens. Right, there's literature showing that. So if we can have basically a, a cell source of engineered beta cells and get EVs from those cells, then you know maybe that can start to be a little bit safer than having um, kind of this immortalized tumor cell line. There is also still a question of, you know, what about all these other things that are in the EVs? And that's gonna take a little, a little bit more kind of investigation, a little more digging to find out what all is in there. Um, and you know that can be done through things like proteomics, lipidomics, um, looking at kind of the the RNA profile of these EVs, right? Because there is plenty of literature showing that all these different components of EVs 
do have effects on the cells that they're interacting with. Um, but th the question is, can we kind of engineer the EVs so that their main effect is, is to interact with the immune system in a particular way? That, yeah. that is yet to be determined, but you know, it's something that we, that we have you know, considered in all of this in these kind of future directions, right? Yeah, I would just also offer uh, Matthew that it, this is really elegant and, you know, thank you for this walkthrough of all these protocols, but sort of like from a general, you know, question side, uh, experiments also, you know, that were done in vitro, mm -hmm. right? And very elegant, as I said, and, and really, you know, um, getting at the mechanisms behind what's happening here. But if you mm -hmm. think about in vivo, like, could you anticipate off-target effects and, you know, and would you anticipate temporal effects? I mean, have you even thought about that? It's, it's, it's kind of far down the road, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, no, that, that is something that um, Ed, Ed and I talked about uh, quite frequently is, you know, if we want to start to get into, you know, some in vivo, some animal studies with this, um, what, what is that going to look like um, as, as far as off-target effects go? One of the one of the biggest challenges with EV based therapies is um, kind of what is the best route of administration to get the EV therapy where you need it to go and to have it there for long enough, right? So kind of that temporal uh, factor that you're talking about. Um, so EVs are are pretty stable in bio biological fluids because of their their lipid bilayer composition, but they're also cleared pretty rapidly. Um, so in a matter of usually like three to four days, if it, if they're administered IV, they're cleared. Um, if they're administered IP, they can stick around a little longer. Um, if you administer them subcutaneously, um, maybe about a week, week and a half before they all start to get cleared out. Um, but then, you know, the, the question of, you know, kind of off target effects, how do you get them where you want them to be? It's, uh, that, that's a very difficult question. Um, and a lot of it is you just kind of put them in, in the body, determine the best route of administration and, and hope that they're going to get to where they need to be. You can start to think about ways to further engineer the EVs to kind of um, get them to be kind of tissue specific. So there is evidence showing that EVs have a certain trophism for the tissues that they're derived from. So if we're talking about having beta cell EVs, maybe they have a specific tropism for you know, targeting towards the pancreas, towards, towards islets. There's also a certain like targeting molecules you can engineer onto the EVs to make sure they get to where they need to go. Um, and then, you know, what, one of the nice things about the, the PD-1, pd one pathway is that there's less of a chance for off-target effects because that pathway is antigen specific. So unless the EV is um, interacting with, uh, the, the proper TCR, the proper kind of um, T cell environment, whether that be through direct recognition or through kind of that endocytosing pathway that I was talking about, unless that's happening, there's a very, there's a small chance that there's going to be off target kind of immune suppressive effects. Um, so that's, yeah, all, that's all good news for future engineering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's what, what we've done here, as, as you said, is kind of, you know, I, I would, I'm not going to call it elegant, but use the word elegant. So we have kind of these elegant solutions to, you know, see kind of preliminarily, is this a feasible idea? Um, and then the hope is that, you know, we can take the lessons that we learn from these very controlled environments and start to put them in kind of less and less controlled environments and tinker with it and see, see what we can do to get it to be uh, safe and effective. Um, and we've pretty much gone through all of this. Um, and I guess kind of, you know, the last thing I'll say to wrap up, um, and to kind of make, make the case for, for EVs as a, as a cell-free therapy, um, is that really what we've shown here is that there is potential for EVs, for immune engineered EVs to modulate T cell effector functions in, in a type one diabetes setting, in an autoimmune setting. Um, and really their main advantages, as, as I said, is that they're cell-free, right? So we don't have to worry about um, any sort of cell therapy, FDA regulatory approval. They're antigen specific, right? Because this PD-1, pd one pathway is dependent on MHC, TCR interactions. And then we can also start to have kind of this patient personalized approach to immunotherapy, as we talked about in the beginning.
where we can look at a particular patient's um, disease pathology, disease etiology, and maybe start to tailor this specific therapy to their specific um, disease state that they're in. Um, and, you know, I am at ASU now, but as I mentioned, all this work was done when I was in Ed's lab. So I, of course, have to acknowledge all those people there, myself, all the, all the lab members that are just there. Um, Jorge recently defended last week. So congrats to Dr. Santini. Um, and then, of course, some of the Brusco lab members were very instrumental to this, Thinzar and Liana. And then uh, my funding sources through the NIH, that T32 and the F31, and then as, as well um, an R01 that, uh, that Ed had as well. Um, and I will just leave the rest open for questions if there's any. Yeah, fantastic talk. I mean, if um, I, I, it feels like to me that um, just sort of this walkthrough has been so inspirational and there's such interesting work coming out of the Phelps lab, Briscoe lab, University of Florida, as we know, is a T1D powerhouse, but also um, we know that ASU has some really interesting work coming along and uh, the Weaver lab as well is really mm -hmm. pursuing some interesting new approaches. So yeah, I'm, I'm really that, excited to be there right now. Yeah. That said, I think, you know, to the trainees out there, graduate students, postdocs, like I would look into these laboratories because there's so many, there's so much exciting work and it's really cutting edge. Last call for questions. It looks like you have so many kudos in the chat. Thank you. Great talk. Great work. Interesting. Um, reach out directly to, you know, Matthew Becker at ASU. Absolutely. And um, if you have further questions, but again, this is a really a beautiful system. And uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Course, happy Halloween. Yeah. Happy, happy Halloween. Halloween. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.